Sure. Guys, it's been such a beautiful morning already, and uh, preachers always have this dilemma when the worship and even the announcements were so full of life that you're like, she, how, how do I start with as much energy and uh, as much goodness? So I thought I'd, uh, I'd uh, top that all with Scripture. Um, that's a good way to start, and it tops everything else. Um, so guys, I'm going to start off from Proverbs uh, 18, verse 20. It says, From the fruit of a man's mouth his sum- stomach is satisfied. He is satisfied by the yield of his lips. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. And I think that's a, that's a word that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show us how it ties into our, our series we're going after at the moment, The Tree of Life. And um, I've seen how our words have brought life, and I've also seen how they've brought death. And... Uh, when my, my cousin Tristan, who I'm the same age as, uh, when he used to say naughty words, his dad used to make him eat these little chilies. And, uh, and when he got a little bit older, he got tired of eating these chilies. And he thought he was, you know, old enough to stop eating chilies now. And so one day he was like, mm-mm, mm-mm. And, but my uncle was trying to get chilies in his mouth. And uh, as, as we know with experience, I'd rather have chili in my mouth than on my mouth. And it became a very awkward day for a parent because my uncle had to take my cousin to uh, the hospital and explain why he's in the hospital. And so, guys, there is death in our words. And you could end up in hospital if you're not careful with what words you say. And my cousin taught me that when he was six. But I've also seen and heard and experienced the good side of it. And uh, sometimes uh, as a preacher you get a download uh, on Saturday night what God's going to put on your heart even though sometimes it's on the way to the meeting Um, and uh, I don't envy those moments Uh, I'm blessed that I have been preparing this word since a grade six oral that I labeled the power of the tongue so here we are and mom correct me if I'm wrong but I think I won that oral or something hey in more mind there we go guys if you want affirmation get your mother in the front row um (laughs) Talking about uh, having a good front row, I'm so grateful for the Elsners coming here today. Um, I really appreciate this. this. is Hannah's family, so thanks for letting us have Hannah, and thanks for being here today. And guys, so I, I had the understanding of this all the way back in grade six, that there was the scripture that says there's life and death and the power of the tongue, um, and we have authority in that, and I understood that, but I only really uh, understood the actual manifestation of it when I was in probably, well, definitely the most difficult season of my life. I was in Pretoria. I was my last years of studies, and it was a time where I was, I was the most stressed I've ever been, the most anxious I've been, the most depressed I've been. I was sick to the point where I couldn't play sport. I was lonely, um, and it was a really difficult time, and I felt like I had no purpose, and to the point where I, I couldn't even sleep. I used to lie there for hours and hours and hours, just with doubt and insecurity and stress just going through my mind. I used to just lie there all night and then have to wake up and I I would wake up and I'd go sit in lectures and actually just couldn't even do anything. And it was the most horrible season of my life. And I realized, and in that season, there was something that changed completely. I was lying in my bed awake at night and I just said out loud, I said, hey dad. And I just started this conversation out loud. And I spoke, and I spoke, and I spoke until I fell asleep. I was like, okay, that worked. Let's do it again. And I went through the season where I used to speak and pray out loud every single night until I found rest. And in that moment, I realized what the scripture was saying. It says there was death, but when our words are with God, there is life. And it was still a season that I look back with with so much fondness because I have won victory in my understanding that is still echoing in my life today. And still out of the dark seasons, when I'm driving my car, I will not play any music or anything. I will speak out loud the words of truth that God has spoken over my life. And for me, that's such a message of the tree of knowledge of good and evil versus the tree of life. And sometimes we get stuck in the tree that says, what about this circumstance? What about what the world is saying? What has that serpent said to you? But stepping into the tree of life and choosing to partner with the words of Jesus brings life. And that's why you've heard it a lot. We say, blah, 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 Jesus. 
because the blah, blah, blah is a distraction and a devastation to what we are doing in the kingdom. But when we say Jesus, we bring life. And if you haven't understood why we're saying that, I want to unpack this today, that we're going to put aside the blah, 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 put aside the tongue that brings death, and we're going to say Jesus. And we're going to say, Jesus, your will be done through our words, through the authority that we carry in our words. And I love starting my, my preachers with a bit of a disclaimer, and I want to start with, in my mind, what is the most misquoted scripture from what I've heard from our circles. And I don't know if it's a millennial thing, um, but this scripture I find we misquote so often. Who's heard the scripture that says, or the verse that says, he will give us the desires of our heart? I want to tell you, that's not even a full scripture. That's not even a full verse. But we only hear that part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. You know, there's a verse that is two words. It says, Jesus wept. That is a whole scripture, a whole verse, sorry. This is not a whole verse. It's not even a whole passage of scripture. But we often use it as a whole passage. He will give me the desires of my heart, period. You forgot that that sentence didn't even start as a sentence. You're halfway through a sentence. So let me read from Psalm 37, verse 3 and 4. It says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Amen. Some translation says, When our hearts align with the will of the Father, then He will give us the desires of our heart. And I want to preface everything I say today, that if our will is not in line with the Father's will, then we will not get what our words speak into. And sometimes we put the cart before the horse, and we say something along the lines of, God, I really want to be rich, because it will bring glory to my name and my children's name. Please may that be in your will. Instead of saying, Father, may your will be done in my finances so that your glory will come. And it says that God's will be done. So let's partner with that. So everything I say today, please may we understand that when our words find authority in the Father, then the glory will be found. And there is such importance, and we see it through, through Scripture and even what we do now, in the power that we carry with our words. There's a reason why on the seventh day when the, the Israelites were marching around Jerusalem, I mean, uh, uh, around Jericho, that they shouted praises and the walls came down. And even the fact that they are shouting the praises speaks to an authority that they are carrying in those words. There's a reason that we cast out demons with the voice of authority. There's a reason why the prophets stand up and speak the prophetic words. There's even a reason why we stand here as preachers and unpack the scriptures with our words. And I want to unpack three things about where we carry authority in our words. I want to speak about worship, I want to speak about blessing, and I want to speak about power. And worship team, I am so grateful that we get a partner with you in singing worship. I really honestly appreciate you guys, and there's a toll that you guys carry and a weight you guys carry. Where's Brendan Lake? He's looking like Brendan Lake recently. <laughs> you guys are such a blessing to us because I think what happens in worship, and you could, there's many things, but what I want to focus on today, first of all, you enable us to step into our design. We know we were designed to worship. And we've been saying that either we can worship things of this world and look like the world, or we can worship the Father and start looking like the Father. And as we worship the Father, we understand His will in His heart and we align with it. And then our words carry power. Are we getting it? The other thing is that our worship changes atmospheres. Who's ever come into church on a Sunday morning heavy? You know? Only Sid is honest here. <laughs> I've come in here and I've had a tenant that hasn't paid for seven months and I've been sick and this is going on and I've come in heavy and when I step into a space of worship and when I declare my worship, there's a heaviness that gets lifted not only in my life but in the atmosphere around me. 
And if we are going to be saying we want revival, I think it starts with what comes out of our lips in worship. The other thing I think worship does is that it provides unity to the bride. And let's be honest, it's one of the most foolproof places to get unity. You can do home groups well and still have disunity. You can do leadership teams well and still have disunity. You can do ministries together and still have disunity. But when we all come here and sing together, I believe the Father is smiling because His bride is unified. And I'm glad we all don't have to sing the same notes because I don't have that capacity. But we can sing the same words and it is beautiful. And when we partner with that, we bring glory to the Father. And we also as a unified bride, unlock us for what we were created to do. And another tool that we have to unlock people in what they were created to do is my next point, which is blessing. And I want to read two scriptures. The first comes from Matthew 3, verse 16 to 18. If you guys want to turn there. So these, this is the first and the second time that we hear an audible voice from heaven when Jesus is on this earth. So I think it's pretty important. <laughs> so the first says, from Matthew 3, verse 16 to 18, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descend like a dove and come, coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The first audible words that we hear in the New Testament from the Father was the Father speaking blessing over his son. And the second time we hear it is John 12, verse 27 to 30, and actually touches a bit on Evan's word, which which talks about, and the, and the context is Jesus is just saying how he struggled with the idea of him going to die. And we all know the story about him saying, God, take this cup away from me. But what, it, what he says, he says, this is Jesus speaking, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this very reason that I came for this hour. Father, glor glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Beautiful, the words that come from heaven. If you think of all the things that the Father could have uttered from heaven publicly to this earth when his son was on this planet, these are the two things that, that come about from what I can find. You're welcome to correct me if I'm wrong. I spend a lot of time trying to find things. And it is a word of blessing and a word of encouragement. Jesus said, I want your name glorified, and God says, I have glorified it, and will do it again. How amazing. And I have the privilege of being involved in a ministry called Pass Through Fire, where we take young boys and their fathers to a, a weekend away in the bush, and it gets really tough at points. And there's always a moment on every weekend where there's a boy going to a father and saying, Dad, I can't do it. And these are 12 and 13 year olds and they say, Dad, I can't, I, I don't have the strength and sometimes there's some tears. And in that moment, I watch so carefully because a father has an opportunity to do one of two things. And I will tell you the outcome is almost instantaneous from what happens. The first words that I see is either the father says something along the lines of like, it's okay, my boy, you're right, you know, like I, I'll get you out of it. I can see this is tough, it's okay, you're like, you're not ready. And instantly what happens then is that that boy believes that word. But what I see happen, and this gets me excited, gives me goosebumps right now, is a father that says, my boy, you can. You have the power to get through this, and I back you. And church, what words are we speaking to each other in this body? Are we saying, my boy, my girl, my sister, my brother, you can do this. That ministry that God has placed on your heart, you can do this, I back you. Are we doing that? Because there is power in the words that we say. Like I said, it is so instantaneous from when that boy is told he can or can't do it. It's like, almost like it's like clockwork. 
And sometimes if we're looking around and seeing that the people around us are not living in their authority and in their calling and their blessing, then maybe we can come in and speak blessing. And I love the story, um, and, and Dad, you've told it a few times, but I'll tell it again. I even shared it on Tuesday night. But there was a farmer in the States that was producing the best maize crop like year after year after year. And they came to him and they said, what is the key to your successful farming? And he said, what I do every year in my harvest, I take my best grain and my best crop and I go give it to my neighbors. And they said, what do you mean? Like, you know, like, no, I want to know about your crop, not your neighbors. He says, no, when my neighbor's crops are doing well, then those are the crops that fertilize my crops. Pollinate, Pollinate sorry. The farmer Roger over here. And guys, if we are not speaking life into the person next to us, our farms are also going to die. And I was speaking in the context on Tuesday night, we had a whole bunch of churches here, and it was really amazing to see the body of Christ come together. And I was saying, every church, we need to be giving good crop to. We need to be blessing so they can be a blessing to us. And in this building, we need to be speaking blessing over each other. Because that's what we saw the Father do. And I don't know if you know, Jesus had a pretty cool ministry. (laughs) But he had the backing of his father speaking life and blessing over him. And we see it in Jewish culture. I I think in in this regard, the Jewish culture has it so down. I think they do it so well. They speak blessing over their children. And we see, and I saw a stat the other day, and it blew my mind, that the United States comprises only of 2.4% Jews. But Jews in the U.S. own 65% of all property, all land. And because, and if you read through some of their traditional uh, blessings they speak over, over their kids, it says things like, you will have blessing over your finances. You, and they just speak it and speak it, and they put their money where their mouth is. And are we willing to step out and put our money where our mouth is and say, we speak blessing over the generation that's coming? And I've had the the privilege and and also the heartache, um, sure, this is tough, of of watching young men battle really difficult wars. And Chris, I know you're here. You have a really tough battle, bro. You're in an environment where Chris is 17 and he's an on-fire believer, and it is a tough battle. And I think we need to be speaking blessing over that. Because I minister at Kersney quite often, and I ask them, what is their biggest struggles they deal with? And they say, when I mention the name of God, people laugh at me. And we need men and women around us to be coming in and saying, actually, I'm not going to laugh at you. I'm going to speak blessing over your life, and I'm going to say, run this good race. And Chris, keep running, bro. And all the young people out there, keep running. You are in the most dangerous territory, but you are backed by people in this building and in your Father in heaven. So guys, let's blow wind into sails. Let's speak life into ministries. Let's pick people up, dust them off, and say, carrying on ministering in your school. And let's pray for people. I'll be honest, probably one of the most awkward uh, moments I've had on this campus. I I worked here for a year, um, and we were going through a time where there were a lot of break-ins and uh, awkward story. Uh, I used to show people around the campus if they wanted to have uh, events here, and I took them downstairs to the vault to show them our beautiful vault, and I walked in there, and the ceiling was ripped down, and people had ripped off the TVs. And I just looked at the people and said, oh, sorry, guys, we're just a bit of renovations at the moment. But we, we actually went through a season where people kept breaking in. And actually, we took a moment and we said, and, and credit to Dad and everyone, we went for a walk around our campus, and we prayed blessing and protection over this campus. And I'll be honest, it was awkward, <laughs> very awkward. But it actually unlocked something where we stopped seeing attack over our campus. And I was like, that was awkward, but that brought life. And sometimes we've got to put our money where our mouth is and step into those awkward spaces. And there is power in what we declare with our mouths. And that's my last point. When God created the heavens and the earth, he used his words. When he created man, he breathed his life into us. God could have 
put us through his 3D printer, polished us off and sent us out. But he chose to speak it into existence. He said, let there be light. And in the, in the Great Commission I mentioned in our prayer meeting this morning, the Bible says, all power and authority I will give to you. And we have the opportunity to declare to a dark world that let there be light. And in my research in this, and um, you know, I was doing a few weeks ago, and Caleb actually mentioned it yesterday as well, um, that there's a study that came out, and uh, Discovery did a, a study, and they called it the glue that holds the world together. And their scientists have only recently discovered in the last 50 years that there are sound waves that hold all atoms together. Okay, I'm not seeing enough shock and horror. There are sound waves that hold the world together. The world that God spoke into existence is being held together by that breath which he's spoken into existence to this day. Every atom, everything, every creation, even me, am hold together by sound waves that God spoke all those years ago. And we now have the power and authority to be speaking into these sound waves the glue that holds the universe together. We have an opportunity to choose the tree of life, to choose to use our words to bring life into this universe. And for me, the crux of this tree of life is, that am I gonna choose words of power or am I gonna choose words of destruction? Am I gonna use my words to hold the universe together as God designed it? Am I gonna partner in my sanctification with what the Father is doing? Or am I gonna choose my own selfish ways of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? My own knowledge, my own selfishness, my own pride. Why am I gonna speak life? And if you guys can turn to Ezekiel 37. You know, you miss the days when you could hear the pages turning so then you can have your water. <laughs> but in faith, I know you're on your app, so I'll have a moment to drink my water. Okay. I think I'm gonna skip a few verses down. And then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath into you and you will come alive. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise a rattling sound, and the bones came to life, bone to bone. And I looked, and, uh, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come, breathe, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and breath entered them, and they came to life, stood up to their feet, a vast army. That has to be one of the most powerful passages that we need to grab a hold of. And I want to unpack it briefly, because I'm, I'm running out of time. But we, in this case, Ezekiel, was in communication with the Father, and God said to him, you prophesy over these bones. And what I wanna say is that the amazing thing about bones is that they don't decay. And there are bones in our graveyards that we need to be speaking life into. There are ministries that have been spoken that are as solid as bones that have died in our backyard. There are bones that need to have flesh and need to have breath spoken into them so that they may come alive once more. And even now, I want us to start thinking, what are the spaces of our life that we have neglected? What are the spaces that where there was once life and now there is not? What are the prophetic words that have been spoken over your life? What are the promises of your life that we need to be speaking flesh onto? 
What are the areas that once saw life and saving people and healing people and casting out demons and operating in our fullness, if we look at now, are actually just a pile of rattly bones? What are areas in your life where you had thriving relationships with mothers and fathers and children and brothers and cousins? Where have those relationships lost life? And we need to pick up the authority that we have put down next to those bones and speak life into it. Not because we bring life, but we usher in an authority and a person that does bring life and his name is Jesus. Are we gonna stop saying blah, 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 I can't do this, I can't do that, I don't have authority in the situation. Are we gonna say Jesus? Are we gonna speak it with authority? When Jesus heard that Lazarus was dead, it said he proclaimed with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Are we gonna say to these dry bones in our lives, come to life, come out of your grave and speak life and blessing and worship and power in our communities? And I think the most powerful, and maybe I actually could get the band up now. I think the most powerful words that we are ever called to utter come from Romans 10 verse nine. And it says, but if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 